that speaker then of the term. Um, on your way out, everyone grabs term cards. We have some excellent other speakers coming up this term. Um, and um, so I don't really have to give uh, Mr. Carswell here much of an introduction for everyone knows a lot of his history. Um, he is currently UKIP's only MP. Um, he was a Tory MP until a certain defection. Um, and so I think let's just get on straight on with the talk. Um, but firstly, I'd like to give a very quick poll of the audience. So who here so far um, will be voting or feels they'll certainly be voting to leave the EU in the referendum? Who's not sure? And who feels they'll definitely be voting to stay in? Okay, so we know who we have to target now. <laughs> I, uh, please everyone join me in welcoming Mr. Carter. Thank you so much for inviting me to come along, and I really just wanted to start off by saying I, I think we can say with some certainty that there's going to be a referendum almost certainly on, on June the 23rd. Now, it, it may not be June the 23rd, it may be September, October, but I think we can say with some certainty that um, a, a, a referendum this year is, is very likely. And I think um, it's also fair to say that unlike this meeting, where I think it's fair to say the balance of opinion is, is, is for uh, leaving. Amongst the country as a whole, um, opinion is, is actually pretty evenly split. There have been a series of opinion polls out recently showing that uh, the number of people who would vote to leave and the number who would vote to remain are, are much for muchness. I think it's a, a fairly accurate generalisation to say that about a third of people in the country are going to vote... Um, to stay in pretty much whatever happens. They've made up their mind, and about a third of people are for Remain. About a third of people are pretty staunchly for, for leaving, and they're pretty rock solid, and many of the arguments that we'll hear over the next uh, 20 or so weeks um, probably won't shift opinion amongst those two thirds. But then, there are in the middle a lot of undecideds, and it's the undecideds who are gonna determine the outcome of, of this referendum. Um, we may not wish it were so, but it's, it's mathematics. The undecideds, people who've, as of today, not yet made up their mind, are going to decide whether or not uh, we leave or, or remain. And I think it's really, really important to make that point, because I think it tells us about the sort of tone that we should use over the next 20 weeks. I think we should make a real effort to recognise that there are good decent, honest people in favour of the European Union. Um, they may be deeply flawed and misguided and, and wrong, <laughs> like Ken Clark, but, but they're decent people. And I think the arguments that we engage in should never have that slight hint, slight tone of, of ugliness that I think some people felt during the, the, the Scottish referendum. I think we, we really need to remember that however fiercely we may disagree with our opponents in this, we need to, to, to keep it very civil and, and, and incredibly uh, uh, respectful. Now, now, David Cameron is going to announce, probably uh, next Friday, um, or possibly on the Andrew Marr show, uh, 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 a week on Sunday, um, that he's got a new deal. He's going to unveil Dave's new deal. And we're going to be told that um, this fantastic, amazing new deal means that all those reservations that people have had about the relationship between this country and, and the European Union are, are somehow resolved. But I, I think it's fair to say that that argument is, is ridiculous. Not even the most ardent Europhiles are trying to pretend that David Cameron's New Deal adds up to a row of beans. I personally think there's something actually rather pitiful about a Prime Minister trying to pretend that somehow blaming a few Polish plumbers for claiming in work benefits is, is the issue. This is not about uh, who claims in work benefits or out of work benefits. And it's, it's simply not on to try to claim that the problems of this country's relations with the European Union are going to somehow be fixed by some deal that targets. Um, migrant workers. Um, I, I do think that 
David Cameron's likely to try and pull various sort of white rabbits out of the hat. There's, there's likely to be something in his New Deal that, that tells us that um, our constitutional uh, supremacy will be enshrined in, 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 in law. There will be some, some attempt, perhaps, at uh, pulling a, a white rabbit out of the hat over, over human rights legislation. But um, I, I, I really don't think it, it addresses fundamentals. And I think there are three fundamental reasons why we need regardless of Davis and New Deal, why we need to leave the European Union. And the first of these is, is about economics. If we leave the European Union, we will be better off. Our children and our grandchildren will be better off. We're told that being in the European Union is good for the economy. Indeed, we were, we were sold membership back in the 1970s on the basis that it was good for the economy. It was supposed to be an economic proposition, wasn't it? We were told that if we surrendered a little bit of self-government, we would be more prosperous and richer. Looking across the channel at the Euro crisis, who, who seriously believes that? Who seriously believes that by being more closely integrated with the European Union, we will become better off? It's not just the Eurozone crisis, although, you know, I think that's done quite a lot to discredit people like uh, Peter Mandelson and Roland Rudd, cheerleaders of the In campaign, who uh, 15 years ago were saying that unless we abolish the pound, we would face economic ruin. It's not just about the Eurozone. Since 2007, the financial crisis, the economy of China has grown about three times. China's about three times larger in terms of its output than it was. <coughs> India's about twice the size of what it was. Even Brazil, which hasn't been doing too well in recent months, is about 40% bigger than it was. In the European Union, the only indices that have grown that amount are those that measure debt and unemployment. We have locked ourselves into the world's only declining trade bloc. It's actually been a pretty benign global environment for economic growth over the past few years. Global output in many countries is up. Even parts of the world which we traditionally thought of as economic failures, sub-Saharan Africa, even they're doing pretty well. During the height of the Eurozone crisis, a, 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 a Spanish minister rather contemptuously said that Spain is not Uganda. Indeed, it's not. The Ugandan economy grows at an average of 6% a year. <laughs> <laughs> the reality is that when we joined what was to become the European Union in the 1970s, it accounted for 38% of world output. About 40% of everything the world produced was produced in what was to become the European Union. Today, it's about 24%. By the mid-2020s, it will be about 15%. Europe is in a state of not just relative economic decline. Europe is, I would argue, in a state of absolute economic decline. I, I used to live many years ago in, in Italy. I left at the turn of the 20th century. Now, think back, what were you doing in the year 2000? Think back, I don't know what stage you were at in life in the year 2000. It's quite terrifying to think that Italy is no richer today than it was in the year 2000. Its economy simply hasn't grown, its per capita wealth simply has not increased in all of that time because it is trapped in this economic zone. Now, in 2005, when I was first elected as a member of parliament, two-thirds of the value of UK exports went to the European Union. Two-thirds of everything we exported to the world went to the EU. Today, it's 47%. Now, that is such a precipitous decline. I, I hate to think what it will be by the time I, I sit down. The European Union is declining in importance with every set of trade statistics. It is a rapid, far-reaching, and profound change in our economic uh, focus. And yet we're trapped because of decisions made by Ted Heath and people in the 1970s, before even I was born, we're trapped in the European Union. Now, you might say, okay, well, let's change the European Union from within. That has been the cry of every British Prime Minister since we joined. In 2001, Tony Blair forced the other leaders in the European Union to sign up to what's called the Lisbon Agenda. 
The Lisbon Agenda, and I quote, was going to make the European Union the most dynamic part of the world economy by 2010. <laughs> How did that work out? The European Union, for all the communiques and all the wishful thinking and all the talk about competitiveness, cannot become competitive for a fundamental reason. The European Union is built on the idea that things must be arranged top down, that things must be regulated. What we're told is a single market that would liberalise trade isn't a single market at all. If the European Union was a single market that liberalised trade, if it was legal to manufacture, buy and sell something in Cambridge, it would be legal to buy and sell it in Cologne. That's not the case. It's only legal to buy and sell and make things in Cologne or Cambridge if you comply with a set of rules imposed uniformly by Brussels, usually at the behest of someone with a vested interest in writing the rules to exclude their competitor. It's a permission-based system. It is a top-down regulatory system. It cannot become competitive. It is in the nature of the European Union that it cannot become competitive. If we were to leave the European Union, yes, we could trade with the European Union. We would have to comply with EU single market regulations when selling to the European Union. Every other country selling to the European Union has to do that. But we wouldn't have foisted upon us a blizzard of regulations that stifles innovation. I have in my own constituency two businesses that have had to stop making products that they have made successfully for years as a direct consequence of this. Now, if we leave the European Union, we can realign ourselves. Where the <coughs> is. It would be unimaginable, wouldn't it, if we were not in the European Union, we would have a free trade agreement today with the United States. We'd have a free trade agreement with China. We'd have a free trade agreement with the EU. And for heaven's sake, if South Korea can have a free trade agreement with the European Union, then our close neighbours would have a, a free trade agreement with us, the fifth largest economy in the world. If we leave the European Union, we can have those close trade ties with the European Union and with the rest of the world. By being in the European Union, they never actually seem to materialise. Many of the free trade agreements that the European Union has conducted in our name are anything but free trade agreements. If you talk to people who sell cane sugar into the European Union, in uh, Africa, in, in Central America, they will tell you that those free trade agreements only allow them to export a certain quota, lest it conflict with the interests of subsidised French beetroot farmers, or well, uh, sugar beet farmers. The, the European Union means that, fundamentally, we're not a proper democracy anymore. The essence of democracy is that you can agree with people like me, you can disagree with people like me, you can have Tony Blair at the height of his popularity in 2001 and at the nadir of his popularity today. The key is that you can kick us out. You could have a socialist, you could have uh, Kate Hoey standing in front of you and you could profoundly disagree with her. You could have me standing in front of you and profoundly disagree with me. You could kick us out. You have the power to decide who governs you. By being in the European Union, we give up that ability, we give up that power, we give up that self-control. Many of the parameters of public policy are no longer changed when you supposedly change a government. Many of the things that appear in parties' manifestos are no longer in the gift of parties to actually deliver after they've been elected, which I would say incidentally is one of the reasons why there's a growing disaffection with the political class. Now, we've had in this country a, a, a long march of the progressives, and I think it's to the great credit of the centre-left in this country that the left has often been on the right side of those debates, that great progressive crusade. I don't just mean in the past few decades, I mean going, going back to the, the, the Putney debates, to the levellers, to the chartists, going back to the, uh, the suffragettes. Again and again there's been this uh, advance of the idea that more people should have the vote, and those with the vote should be able to control their government and sack their government. But the European Union has subverted democracy. It means that it doesn't matter who you vote for, the same crowd get together in places like Davos and decide things for us at our expense. If you look at the European Union, one of its few growth industries is, is lobbying. And the reason for that is because so many big businesses today, they no longer spend their marketing budgets doing what they should do in a free society, which is to persuade willing customers to buy what they sell at a price they're willing to pay. They spend their marketing budgets 
hiring an army of lobbyists in Brussels, an army of lobbyists who they rely on to rig the rules for the advantage of the big corporations. That is why Brussels has more lobbyists per head of population than any other city in the world. Big corporate interests have a vested interest in Brussels. And again and again over the next few weeks, we're going to hear the voice of Goldman Sachs, of JP Morgan, of all the big corporate vested interests with skin in the game in Brussels, telling us, Britain, come to heel. I, I, I think we need something more than to be run for the convenience of big corporate interests in Brussels. The fundamental reason why I think Euroscepticism is, is going to win is because contrary to what we're told again and again, Euroscepticism is, is not some backward reactionary movement. It's not a sort of Alf Garnet political force. If it was, it would have fizzled away. It would have, it would have lost popularity uh, decades ago. Ultimately, the European Union is, is built on a series of assumptions about technology, about governance, and about the way that the world should be organised. That are, that are out of date. The European Union is built on the notion that to be big and to be a big block is beautiful. It's built on a mid-20th century assumption that you need economies of scale. Now, modernity created assumptions that big was beautiful. The 20th century was dominated by the idea that you needed mass marketing. Everything, towns got bigger, bridges got bigger, marketing budgets got bigger. You needed mass production, mass consumption, mass markets. I, I think Digital turns many of those assumptions on their head. Digital means that proximity to markets has never mattered less. A business in my constituency in the age of Amazon, where the world is a mouse click away, can trade as, as easily with, with Canterbury in New Zealand as with Canterbury in Kent. Many of our assumptions about the need for size in a market uh, 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 rebutted by the fact that digital allows you to produce for markets a, a, a niche, distinctive, particular, and local. There's a fascinating book by, by Chris Anderson, it's a few years out of date now, but it, it's The Long Tail, and it talks about how digital turns many of our assumptions about, about size and scale in everything from retail to politics to production on their head. If we, if we look at the impact of EU membership, on innovation, it, it, it's been pretty catastrophic. Now, you'll get many people, often in receipt of an EU grant, who will tell you that actually if it wasn't for their EU budget, science wouldn't be possible. But that, that's simply nonsense. I would say that the EU is, is strangulating innovation and research. Let, let's take some specific examples. In 2001, 6% of all clinical trials in the world took place in this country. The EU Clinical Trials Directive came into effect that year. Today, just over 1% of clinical trials in the world are conducted in this country. It has been absolutely catastrophic for key, life-saving, pioneering scientific medical research. In areas like, like aquaculture, aquaculture is, is growing fast. Instead of uh, uh, catching fish in the wild, increasingly we're able to grow it, and increasingly we're able to grow it in better, safer, uh, less environmentally damaging ways. But where is it growing? It's not growing in the European Union. The only European country in which it's growing happens to be Norway, which happens to be outside the European Union. Why? Many of the rules and regulations governing it are prohibitively restrictive. I, I've spoken to universities where many of the, the, the key trials that they do in this important sector are simply no longer, uh, uh, it's no longer possible for them to do. Universities do receive a lot of funding from from the EU, absolutely. And universities also benefit from the free movement of the brightest and the best. We need to make absolutely sure that people understand once we've left the European Union, we will continue to have a migration system that allows the brightest and the best. In fact, we would have a migration system that would be tailored to our needs. So I would argue that it would be easier for universities to attract who they want, because we wouldn't have to try and cram everyone into an artificial uh, 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 threshold, um, which we have, have to do at the moment. At the moment, we, we cannot restrict the movement of people from the EU. We therefore have to say no to brilliant uh, uh, software designers and engineers and scientists and doctors 
from the rest of the world. We would actually, I think, have a, a better system of migration if we took back control. <coughs> if we were to leave the European Union, we currently pay about £20 billion pounds a year to the European Union. If we were to leave, um, I think we could make sure that we continue to fund science and research projects. Um, at the moment, many British universities receive funding from the British taxpayer via the EU. The trouble is we, we give the European Union £20 billion a year, we get about £9.5 billion back. Um, we want to make sure that once we've left, we continue to fund science and research, we would be able to do that. And because we would uh, uh, spend uh, in the UK what we spent, rather than sending it to Brussels and losing half of it en route, I think we could, we could afford to spend even more. I, I draw my, my, my comments to a, a, a close with, with, with simply sort of this, this observation. I know many people who are on the political left. I have worked with, with many in the House of Commons and as a constituency MP, it's, it's thanks to the support of former Labour voters that I, I, I managed to win my seat at all. I, I, I know that there are many on the political left who are a good and decent and honourable people. How is it that so many on the political left in this country have ended up in a position where they are on the side of rich bureaucrats imposing austerity in the name of a banking union on tens of millions of southern Europeans? How is it that the so-called progressives on the left of British politics have got themselves into a position where they side with rich bankers who descend from their private jets to preach austerity to Europe? We often are encouraged to think of the European project as high-minded internationalism. And it's often quite tempting to want to support high-minded internationalism. And there's something good and genuinely noble about internationalism. But Brussels is not a seat of high-minded internationalism. <laughs> it's a hotbed of crony corporatism and vested interests. And I hope the British left wakes up in time and listens to people like Kate Hoey, like Tom Harris, like the good, decent Labour members of Clapton constituency Labour Party. And, and they recognise that whatever your, your politics, we will be better off as a country if we make decisions for ourselves so that we can kick out of office uh, those who, who actually govern over us. Thank you.